All right, welcome to the complete neuro review for the US Emily Step 2. In this video, we're going to cover 200 neurology review questions. We're going to have fun mnemonics along the way, and at the end, we're going to talk about updates in neurology that we need to be aware of for the exam. Let's begin with the first question. The best initial step in suspected stroke assessment is MRI, CT without contrast, or CT with contrast. And in suspected stroke, we get a CT without contrast. And the reason is to help differentiate between ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. 85% of strokes are ischemic, but in case it's a hemorrhagic stroke, if we, for example, would give TPA, it would worsen the bleeding. That's why we must get a CT without contrast before treating stroke. And I just may mention over here that kidney stone evaluation is also done with CT without contrast. Important reminder for exam day. Let's move on. What is the most common and most important risk factor for stroke? Of these conditions, the most common and most important risk factor is hypertension. Hypertension is a modifiable risk factor for stroke and it's the most common and most important. Of course, age is also a big risk factor, but it's not modifiable. And you could take a look at these other risk factors for stroke. But again, hypertension being the most common and most important. Question 203, what is the first thing to do for a patient with ischemic stroke? For example, they come in within 4.5 hours of symptoms. And within 4.5 hours, we give TPA, such as Alteplase. TPA greatly reduces morbidity and mortality in cases of ischemic stroke. And here are some important points that we need to be aware of about stroke. TPA, which is given IV, it breaks up clots, but of course do not give in case of hemorrhagic stroke because it will worsen bleeding. TPA must be given within 4.5 hours, and after 24 hours we give dual antiplatelet therapy with, for example, aspirin and clopidogrel. And we give this for 21 days. And finally, some contraindications to TPA include stroke or head trauma within the last three months, major surgery within the last two weeks, glucose less than 50, prior intracranial hemorrhage, GI or urinary bleed in the last three weeks, and high blood pressure, systolic above 185, and diastolic above 110. Now I just wrote over here, let's say a patient is brought in with ischemic stroke and it's been 10 hours since onset, so we can no longer give TPA. What should you do? Thrombectomy. We look for a thrombus, and if there is one, get rid of it, and this can be done within the first 24 hours. We'll talk more about this later. Question 204. Carotid and arterotic... Carotid endarterectomy in a completely asymptomatic patient is indicated never or if there's 80% stenosis. And the answer is, if there's 80% stenosis, this procedure can be done. Some say the number is actually 70%. And we can take a look at that picture in the, Im in the image over, and we can take a look at the stenosis in this image over here. I just made mention, if it's below 50%, there's never a benefit. And if it's between 50 and 70, there's unclear data on that, and therefore we won't be tested on this. But you definitely need to know that if it's above 70 to 80% stenosis, we go with endarterectomy. And just a reminder of long-term management after TIA or stroke, as we mentioned, the carotid endarterectomy, which is even better than angioplasty. We also get an echo to look for AFib, which may have caused the stroke. We deal with the hypertension, diabetes. We provide statins to all patients dual antiplatelets, as we mentioned, and for cardioembolic strokes, anticoagulation. Question 205. A 65-year-old man has a transient episode of weakness in his right hand and blurred vision without associated headache. What occurred? So he has a transient episode of weakness and blurred vision. What happened? This is a left-sided carotid TIA. A TIA, by definition, is an event which symptoms last less than 24 hours, although usually less than one hour. So the fact that this episode over here was transient tells us that we're dealing with a TIA. And TIAs are treated with antiplatelet therapy. Question 206. A man experiences a stroke and now has trouble formulating the words he wants to say. What lobe was affected? So this is Broca's aphasia. He has broken speech and he's not able to formulate his words. Where does Broca's aphasia occur? Most people think it's actually in the temporal lobe, but that's a mistake. It's in the frontal lobe. And since 95% of people are left dominant, Broca's is in the left frontal lobe. Question 207. In brown saccard syndrome, there's contralateral deficits in what? brown saccard syndrome, again, was hemisection of the spinal cord. There's going to be contralateral deficits in pain and temperature sensation. In terms of motor function and proprioception, these will be lost on the ipsilateral side. Question 208. Hyperextension injury, for example, of the cervical spine, is most associated with which condition? And the answer is central cord syndrome. Question 209. If the purple areas represent demyelination, what condition is this? So if you recall, this is actually vitamin B12 deficiency, cobalamin deficiency. We see subacute combined degeneration and those neurological deficits. And you could take a look at these other conditions, polio, MS, and Tabes dorsalis, which area of the spinal cord they affect. Question 210. The biceps reflex is mediated by? 
and this is C5 to C6, pick up the sticks. And L1, L2, the testes move, that's the cremasteric reflex, which for example is gone in case of testicular torsion. Question 211. Hip flexion is controlled by which nerve? And this is the femoral nerve. If you take a look at that, this guy kicking over here, he's using his femoral nerve. He's involved in hip flexion as well as knee extension, which are both movements controlled by the femoral nerve. Question 212. First line treatment for trigeminal neuralgia is... And if you recall, this is carbamazepine or oxycarbamazepine. Baclofen is not first-line treatment. That may be given if carbamazepine is contraindicated, for example, in bone marrow suppression. Question 213. Asymmetric muscle weakness is seen in which condition? And this is generally associated with cardio equina syndrome. But both of these are surgical emergencies. But just to review, cardio equina syndrome is due to disc herniation or tumor, and it involves radicular pain, saddle anesthesia, and loss of anal sphincter control and urination. Conus medullaris syndrome often has a more abrupt onset. The numbness typically only is in the perianal area, not shooting down the leg, and the muscles are affected symmetrically. Question 214. If subarachnoid hemorrhage is suspected, but CT is unrevealing, what's the next step? Well, by the way, in subarachnoid hemorrhage, what is the first step? And the answer is CT. But if that's unrevealing, we go with the lumbar puncture. And what does it show us? Red blood cells, xanthrochromia, protein from the red blood cells, and increased intracranial pressure. MR angiography is done once the condition has been confirmed, and this helps us identify the source of bleeding. And just a reminder, subarachnoid hemorrhage symptoms include worst headache of my life, neck stiffness due to meningeal irritation, photobia, and vomiting. And finally, we want to keep the blood pressure down to prevent re-bleeding, which is most likely to occur in the first 24 hours and has a very high mortality. And we give nimodipine to prevent vasospasm and subsequent ischemic stroke. And this occurs from days 4 to 10 post subarachnoid hemorrhage. Question 215. A man with polycystic kidney disease is admitted for subarachnoid hemorrhage. Four hours after admission, he develops weakness in his left arm. What is the cause? So again, this is four hours later. Four hours later, the problem is re-bleeding. Vasospasm, as we said, occurs days later. And I just wrote over here, conditions associated with aneurysms and therefore with SAH, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Question 216. A 50-year-old presents with a two-hour history of numbness and droop on the right side of his face, difficulty talking, and weakness in his right arm. So everything is on the right. The right of the face, as well as the right arm. So we know that's the MCA. MCA could affect the right face, the right arm, and speech. The lesion is in the left MCA because it's contralateral. And of course, the next step, since we're dealing with a stroke, is CT without contrast to rule out hemorrhage and perhaps begin the TPA. Question 217. Which of the following patients would most likely present with a chronic subdural hematoma? And chronic subdural hematoma is seen in alcoholics and the elderly. Elderly and chronic alcohol could lead to an asymptomatic even subdural hematoma. These patients typically have brain atrophy and more fragile veins that are more likely to tear. And as we recall, the CT scan shows banana or moon-shaped hemorrhage. Question 218. A 24-year-old female presents with worsening periorbital headache, fever, and double vision. PE shows bilateral supraorbital edema and lateral gaze palsy. What is the most likely organism? So over here, we're dealing with staph because this is cavernous sinus thrombosis, and we treat it with empiric antibiotics. We give steroids to reduce the inflammation, and we consider surgical drainage if no response. And even with treatment, this condition has a 30% mortality. Question 219. How is migraine diagnosed with MRI or patient history? History, and since this is a clinical diagnosis, the answer is patient history. MRI will not show anything. Now, most important for exam is probably MRI treatment. First of all, the patient should avoid known triggers and get good sleep hygiene. Abortive therapy includes NSAIDs, tryptans. Ergotamine is one of them, but we don't really use it. In terms of prophylaxis, now don't confuse these with the abortive therapy, prophylaxis includes propranolol, which is especially used in pregnancy, the CGRPs, the medications that end with the MABs, anticonvulsants, such as valproic acid and gabapentin, and TCAs, such as amitriptyline. 220. What is first-line prophylactic for cluster headaches? And this is the calcium channel blocker, verapamil. Verapamil is first-line for prophylactic, and alternatives include lithium, valproic acid, prednisone, and topiramate. Sumatriptan is for abortive therapy, which is not really used. First line is really high flow O2, high flow oxygen for cluster headaches. Question 221. A 53 year old mother presents with new onset headaches, similar in presentation to her daughter's cluster headaches. What's the next step? We want to assess for giant cell arteritis by getting an ESR because a new onset unilateral headache in patients above 50 is concerning for this condition. Question 222. This question is extremely important. 
a 76-year-old woman has AFib. She has no significant medical history other than controlled hypertension. What is her TAVAS score and what should be given? So she's a woman, that's considered a point. She's 76, so that's considered two points. And she has hypertension, even though it's controlled, that's another point, so that's four points. And therefore, we give her a DOAC. If one, we would be giving aspirin, but since two or above, we give a DOAC, and if not, we would give warfarin. Question 223. A child experiences multiple intermittent five-second episodes staring at the space. What's the treatment? So this is absent seizure. We give ethosuximide. Ethosuximide is for absent seizures. And second-line treatment is valproic acid. I just wrote a little bit about childhood absence epilepsy over here, and you could take a look. Question 224. A 39-year-old male presents with a single, simple partial seizure of one minute duration, but is no longer symptomatic. He also complains of recent morning headaches and one episode of vomiting. So seizure headaches and vomiting is concerning for a tumor, and that's why we need to get a CT scan if seizures recur, consider anticonvulsant therapy. Question 225. A man is brought in with pure motor hemiparesis of the left face, arm, and leg. Nearby is a woman who presents with pure left-sided sensory deficits of the face, arm, and leg. What do they both have? So here, we're dealing with pure motor and pure sensory. These are both lacunar strokes. Lacunar strokes present with either pure motor or pure sensory. Again, I wrote over here, pure sensory stroke occurs at the VPL of the thalamus or a pure motor stroke at the internal capsule. Other types of lacunar strokes are not really tested. Question 226. What is the correct management for hypertensive emergency? And the answer is, for emergency, we have nitroposide. We want to reduce the blood pressure immediately in a hypertensive emergency. That's where we see signs of end organ damage. Others include labetalol, nicardipine, and hydralazine. And for beta blockers, these are used for management of hypertensive urgency, where we do not see end organ damage. Question 227. Tourette syndrome is diagnosed by motor tics and phonic tics every day or nearly every day for how long? And it is one year. You need both a motor tic and a phonic tic for one year. The main therapy for this nowadays is the VMAT2 inhibitors. It used to be antipsychotics, but the VMAT2 inhibitors, such as tetrabenazine, are becoming first line. Question 228. A patient complains of the room spinning. The patient is asked to turn her head 45 degrees right. Vertigo and nystagmus are reproduced. What's the diagnosis? Of course, that's benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. This is due to an otolith. It presents with transient episodic vertigo and nystagmus, but there's no hearing loss in this condition. Do not give in benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, meclizine. That's contraindicated. Question 229. A man has two distinct episodes of vertigo, lasting more than 20 minutes, one episode of hearing loss and a tinnitus. So this is the triad for Meniere disease. Vertigo, hearing loss, and tinnitus. What's the treatment? All of the above. Meclizine is used to control the vertigo as well as diazepam. Promethazine is an anti-nausea and vomiting medication used in this condition, and a salt restricted diet helps long-term prevention. I just wrote a reminder over here that if we see vertigo and vomiting a week after being diagnosed with a viral infection on exam day, that's likely an acute vestibular neuritis in which steroids may help, but it's self-resolving. Question 230. A 66-year-old presents with a decade of bilateral hand tremors also seen in his mother and older brother, so it's inherited. Tremors are worse with movement. This sounds like essential tremor. He denies difficulty concentrating or falls. What is the treatment? So here, we're dealing with essential tremor, propranolol. Propanolol is first-line treatment for essential tremor, and primidone is second-line, which is an anticonvulsant. If not, we use the anti-epileptic medications. Caffeine could actually make essential tremor worse. Question 231. A woman with fluctuating ptosis and muscle weakness has a positive ice pack test. Labs show positive acetylcholine receptor antibody. What medications are contraindicated in this patient? So this is a myasthenia gravis patient. All of these medications are contraindicated. Which is one point I want to make is that we need to get a chest CT to evaluate for thymoma in patients with myasthenia gravis because if you take the thymoma out in 70% of cases, the symptoms could go away. Question 232. A man with proximal muscle weakness that improves with activity is evaluated. Repetitive nerve stimulation reveals an incremental response. What is the treatment? So here, we're dealing with Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome. I have a picture from my video over here. You can take a look of the lamb eating. Lamb eating, it affects the presynaptic calcium channels, and the treatment for this is 3 4 DAP. 3 4 DAP, got my muscles back, is a rhyme that I thought of. And remember, you must evaluate for small cell lung cancer because this occurs in 60% of cases. Question 233. A woman with optic neuritis has the following MRI. How are steroids given, orally or intravenously? So here is a woman who has multiple sclerosis. That's why she got this optic neuritis, and that's why she has this MRI, and steroids are given intravenously. I wrote all about 
multiple sclerosis over here where we see periventricular white matter lesions on MRI. Now, of course, we need to treat symptoms such as baclofen or tizanidine for spasticity, as we mentioned before. Amandadine is given for fatigue, but we have no idea how that works. Bethenicol is given for neurogenic bladder, and dalfampiridine is given to improve walking distance in multiple sclerosis patients. Question 234. Guillain-Barre syndrome is characterized by autoimmune peripheral demyelination, ascending paralysis, and elevated CSF protein. That's the only thing that we really see in the CSF with Guillain-Barre is elevated CSF protein. It's a completely PNS, peripheral nervous system disease, the opposite of multiple sclerosis, which is completely a CNS disease. It's associated with Campylobacter, and do not give steroids in this condition. We wish that steroids work, but unfortunately they do not. All right, question 240. A treatable form of dementia caused by impaired CSF resorption. So what's the treatment for this condition? Well, the condition is normal pressure hydrocephalus. It presents with wacky, wobbly, and wet. The treatment is CSF drainage, flubopuncture, or a shunt. Question 241. A patient presents with rapid progression dementia and myoclonus. CSF will show elevated. So rapid dementia and myoclonus is pathognomonic for kruz yakovov disease, where we see 1433. By the way, this was replaced by the real-time quacking test. Really funny name. Real-time quacking test in the CSF. That replaced the 1433, but we still need to be aware of this finding in the CSF. Question 242. A 66-year-old male develops progressive loss of executive function in visual spatial processing. He then presents with rigidity, tremor, and a shuffling gait. Autopsy will reveal abnormal clumps of alpha-synuclein because this is Lewy body dementia. In order to distinguish this between Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, the order is key. In Lewy body dementia, they have progressive cognitive changes and visual dementia and visual hallucinations followed by Parkinson-like movement abnormalities. Question 243. A 40-year-old man presents with gradual onset dementia, purposeless dance-like movements, and irritability. His father also had these symptoms at age 45. So this is Huntington disease. The MRI will show caudate and putamen atrophy, and therefore there will be enlargement of the lateral ventricles. Question 244. The best initial treatment in Parkinson's disease is levodopa carbidopa. Here's a little bit about levodopa and carbidopa. And the dopamine agonists, such as ropinirole, bromocryptine, may be used for treatment in early disease too, but they can cause hypotension and confusion. Take a look about selegiline and the Compton inhibitors over here. Question 245. A 44-year-old man has an urge to move his legs, especially at night. So this is restless leg syndrome. What's the treatment? So the answer is pramipexol. And actually, even more than dopamine agonists are gabapentin and pregabalin. Those are actually replacing pramipexol as first-line treatment for restless leg syndrome. And we need to provide iron if there is an associated iron deficiency, which is associated with restless leg syndrome. Question 246. What's the most common adult primary brain tumor? These are glioblastoma multiforme and meningiomas. The other two are in children. And here we just see a picture of the glioblastoma multiforme, where you see the butterfly crossing the midline. Question 247. Another picture of the glioblastoma multiforme. There's a butterfly glioma. What's the prognosis? This is a terrible prognosis. There's often death between one year from the time of diagnosis. Question 248. Autosomal dominant disorder that affects many organ systems, including the CNS and skin. Ashley lesions is on the trunk and sebaceous adenomas, tuberous sclerosis, where we see CNS symptoms and skin symptoms. Serge Weber is another neurocutaneous condition, but there's a port wine stain in the trigeminal nerve distribution. It can lead to glaucoma seizures and intracranial calcifications. Question 249. Damage to the right optic nerve would lead to right anopia. You could take a look at what the other conditions lead to. Question 250. A man has sudden onset headache and a dilated in his right eye that is non-reactive to light. His right eye is hard to the touch. What medication should be avoided? So this is acute closure glaucoma. You do not want to give atropine and other medications which can cause pupillary dilation. Question 251. A diabetic develops loss of visual acuity and difficulty with seeing at night. What is the treatment? We're dealing with a cataract. Surgical lens replacement is the treatment for cataracts. Cataracts are associated with diabetes, hypertension, advanced age, and exposure to radiation. Question 252. Painless gradual loss of central vision with fadoscopy revealing drusen, which is white, yellow, extracellular material. What's the treatment for this? So here we're dealing with a macular degeneration in which there are two types, the dry type and the wet type. And in this question stem over here, we're describing the dry type, the dry macular degeneration, which is the more common one, and there is no treatment for this. Vitamin C and vitamin E and zinc may slow disease progression, but there's no current treatment for the dry macular degeneration. As opposed to the wet type, the vascular wet type, that does have a treatment, VEGF inhibitor. 
253, sudden onset flashing lights and blurred vision. What's going on over here? So this is retinal detachment. The patient sees like these onset flashing lights and blurry vision, and they may describe a curtain coming down over the eye. And you can take a look at central retinal artery occlusion over here, where we see the cherry red spot, central retinal vein occlusion. And you can take a look at the picture over here where we see the hemorrhage cotton wool spots. Question 254, cafe au lait spots, neurofibromas, axillary freckling, lynch nodules, and scoliosis are associated with which type of neurofibromatosis? Neurofibromatosis type one, where we see these conditions, which is much more common than neurofibromatosis type two. Other findings in neurofibromatosis type one include seizures and optic gliomas, as opposed to in neurofibromatosis type two, where we see bilateral vestibular schwannomas. Question 255, first line for trigeminal neuralgia is carbamazepine or oxybarbamazepine. 256, a man with schizophrenia was treated with risperidone. He now has gynecomastia and decreased libido. This occurred due to decreased dopamine in which pathway? Is the tubero interfundibular pathway. Dopamine antagonism here leads to increased prolactin, leading to gynecomastia and decreased libido and amenorrhea in females. Question 257, a 71-year-old woman with a history of CAD and hypertension experiences painless, sudden, transient monocular vision loss. She has had no focal weakness, no weakness or pain. What happened? So this is an embolization. She most likely experienced amaurosis fuga, which is painless, sudden, transient monocular vision loss, most commonly results from carotid artery plaque embolizing in the retinal artery. Question 258, a 76-year-old man has progressive hearing loss, especially in noisy places. He also hears buzzing in both ears. Otoscopic exam is normal. Tuning fork placed in the middle of the head is heard equally bilaterally, and AC is bigger than BC. What's the diagnosis? So this is presbycusis, where air conduction is bigger than bone conduction, which is normal, as opposed to an otosclerosis, where there's stiffening of the ossicles. Bone conduction will be greater than air conduction. Question 258. MRI of a 20 year old male shows inferior displacement of the cerebellum as shown. What is he at risk for? So, here he's going to be at risk for cervical syringomyelia. So we're dealing with the Chiari malformation. And cervical syringomyelia occurs in 30% of patients with Chiari malformation. Question 260 A patient with bilateral retinal hemangioblastomas has a family history of an adrenal tumor. The diagnosis is von Hippel Lindau disease, where we see these retinal hemangioblastomas, we may see pheochrosomatomas, and renal cell carcinomas. Question 261. A 23-year-old woman presents with hearing loss and balancing problems. Her mother had similar symptoms. What's the most likely diagnosis? So this is neurofibromatosis type 2, where we see the vestibular schwannomas and we see imbalance problems. Question 262. A three-year-old boy has refractory epilepsy, development delay, hypopigmented macules, and MRI is shown. What is associated with this condition? This sounds like tuberous sclerosis, which is associated with renal angiomyolipoma, one of the omas associated with tubular sclerosis, along with rhabdomyomyomas and facial angiofibromas. Question 263. A nine-year-old girl has spots on her trunk and her eye is shown. She is at risk for... So over here we see the lich nodules, such as a neurofibromatosis, and this is associated with peripheral nerve sheath tumors. Question 264. A five-year-old girl is brought to the ED for a cerebrovascular accident. She has fair skin, long, thin arms, and legs with joint hyperlaxity. She also has a history of eye problems and development delays. What is the diagnosis? So here you might think it's Marfan, but it's actually homocystinuria. That explains the developmental delays, and that explains the fair skin, which are associated with homocystinuria, marfanoid habitus, and these other conditions. And we also have to assess a patient for thrombosis, because many patients develop thrombosis, for example, a CVA. Question 265. A 20-year-old boy with behavioral changes, neurologic abnormalities, and hepatomegaly should be assessed for, so this patient sounds like he has Wilson disease, we need to check for serum serialoplasmin. He likely has Wilson disease, which can cause neurologic problems due to copper deposition. We diagnose this with biopsy or a 24-hour copper excretion with penicillamine. Question 266. A 17-year-old male has muscle pain and wasting along with small testicles. How is his condition inherited? So this is myotonic dystrophy, which is inherited in autosomal dominant fashion. Question 267. A six-month-old girl who was born preterm has decreased use of her left arm. MRI of the brain shows white matter injury near the right lateral ventricle. What most likely led to this condition? A preterm delivery, which is a risk factor for cerebral palsy. Question 268. A preterm born 10-month-old girl pulls herself to standing using her arms but must drag her legs. She says, mommy and daddy, bilateral lower extremities are hypertonic with notable resistance to passive extension. This sounds again like cerebral palsy. Here's a little bit about cerebral palsy. The first sign is often gross motor delay. Question 269. A patient with intracerebral hemorrhage becomes unresponsive. CT of the head shows right-sided intracerebral hemorrhage with a 7 millimeter midline shift. What's the next step? Intubation and ventilation. And this comes even before mannitol or other measures. Question 270. A 16-year-old girl develops progressive night blindness and peripheral vision loss. Fundoscopy exam shows retinal vessel attenuation. What's the diagnosis? This is retinitis pigmentosa. I have this mnemonic over here. Whereas progressive vision loss is painless. The peripheral rods are affected first. It's passed on to the child because it's inherited and the prognosis is poor. In 
in terms of vision recovery. And I just wrote vitamin A deficiency. That can include xerophthalmia where there's excessive dryness and night blindness. Question 271. A six-year-old man with nausea and vomiting and AMS presents with a brain hemorrhage as shown. What is the cause? A hypertensive intracerebral hemorrhage. As we could see in the picture, this is a basal ganglia intraparenchymal hemorrhage mostly due to hypertensive vasculopathy. Rupture battery aneurysms are seen in subarachnoid hemorrhage and AV malformation ruptures seen mostly in children are quite uncommon. Question 272. Severe onset headache with an associated oculomotor nerve palsy is most associated with subarachnoid hemorrhage, the hemorrhage could lead to oculomotor nerve palsy. Cavernous sinus thrombosis usually presents with fever, headache, and periorbital swelling, and it affects 3, 4, and 6, cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, leading to extensive ophthalmoplasia. Question 273. A woman on warfarin develops a brain hemorrhage. This is a feared complication of warfarin, the hemorrhage. INR6 platelets are at 160. What's the next step? So here we want to give PCC, prothrombin complex concentrate, in order to reverse warfarin in this case. Immediately reverse with IV, vitamin K, and PCC. Question 274. An 85-year-old woman, recent history of falls, it should say, presents with a two-week history of somnolence and confusion. She also developed a mild headache. What's the diagnosis? So here we're dealing with a subdural hematoma, which is seen in the elderly, both acute and chronic forms, and the chronic one presents insidiously weeks after the initial injury, and symptoms can include headache, somnolence, and confusion. 275, a 43-year-old woman presents with sudden onset severe headache with phototopia and vomiting. Non-contrast CT is normal. So this sounds like a subarachnoid hemorrhage where the CT is unrevealing. We want to go next with a lumbar puncture as we spoke about at the beginning of the video. 276, a 70-year-old man presents with sudden complete vision loss of his left eye after 24 hours of blurry vision. The lateral scalp is tender. What should be given? So we're worried about giant cell arteritis, which is not only seen in females, and therefore we give IV steroids and then oral steroids for several months. And we need to look out, of course, for glucocorticoid-induced myopathy and other adverse effects of long-term steroid use. Question 277. A hypertensive woman develops right-sided hemiparesis and then hours later develops vomiting and headache. Pulses now, 52, that should say now. What's the etiology of her condition? So this is an intracerebral hemorrhage that led to her condition. Hemorrhagic strokes tend to have focal symptoms, such as hemiparesis, that rapidly progress to signs of elevated ICP. Question 278. A 73-year-old woman with hypertension has intermittent transient right eye vision loss. She describes a curtain coming down over her eye. What will reveal the diagnosis? A neck ultrasound, because it's very likely that over here she had amaurosis fuga, which is due to retinal ischemia of an atherosclerotic embolus originating from the ipsilateral carotid artery. So we get an ultrasound to the neck. We could find what's going on. Question 279. A patient with Alzheimer's has progressive confusion over the last few hours. CT shows a hematoma in the right parietal lobe. This is due to, well, an Alzheimer's patient. We should assume this is cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Question 280. A lady tilts her head back to the right and develops loss of right face pain and temperature, as well as nystagmus and ataxia. What happened? There's a right vertebral artery dissection, which can present with vertigo and hemicentury loss precipitated by the vertebral artery dissection. Question 281. A man who experienced a stroke shaves only the right side of his face. When asked to stick out his left arm, he sticks out his right. Where is the stroke? Stroke, the right parietal cortex. This leads to hemi neglect where a person's unaware of one side of their entire world. Question 282. Vertigo ataxia, loss of pain and temperature on the left side of the face and right side of the body. Where is the lesion? So here we're dealing with Wallenberg syndrome. It's a lateral medullary syndrome. Wallenberg is a lateral medullary infarct that leads to the vertigo, vertigo ataxia and loss of pain and temperature. And here are just a picture from osmosis all about Wallenberg syndrome. You could take a look. Question 283. What does this CAT scan show over here? So this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. We see blood in the sylvian fissures and blood in the basal cisterns. That's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Question 284. A man with sudden vision loss in one eye has the following fundoscopic image. What is the diagnosis? So here we don't see the cotton wool spots in retinal vein occlusion. We see the cherry red spot. That's the retinal artery occlusion. That's what we see over here. Remember to get an ultrasound. Question 285. A 64-year-old lady with a history of hypertension presents with sudden onset headache with nausea vomiting, non-fatigable and hystagmus. What's the next step? <laughs> this is not the epley maneuver because that would be for BPBV where we would see fatigable and nystagmus. But since it's non-fatigable and nystagmus, we have to worry about something more concerning, more associated with stroke and hemorrhage of the cerebellum. Question 286. A 62 year old woman falls due to imbalance. There's vertigo with movement of the head and dysmetria. What's the next step? The here we give IV out the place because it's likely we're dealing with a stroke. Carotid ultrasound is not for emer emergency situations. That's to assess, for example, for a carotid and arterectomy. Question 287. A patient presents with stroke, which occurred seven hours ago. So it's beyond the 4.5 hour window. He has disabling neurologic symptoms. What's the next step? So here we want to get a CT angiography of the head and neck to know if we should be doing a thrombectomy, which should be done within the first 24 hours of symptoms. Symptoms. Question 288. A patient had an ischemic stroke two hours ago. CT angiography shows a flow void in the left MCA. What's the next step? 
So here we found the source of the stroke. There's a clot. So we need to do both TPA and thrombectomy. Question 289. Spontaneous cerebellar hemorrhage presents with headache, nausea, vomiting, nystagmus, and unilateral hemiataxia. Cerebellum equals balance problems. Seen in patients with hypertension and ataxia seen on the ipsilateral side of the hemorrhage. Question 290. Child with fever, irritability, vomiting, photopia. CSF shows mildly elevated white blood cells, elevated protein, and normal glucose parameters consistent with viral meningitis. Only viral meningitis, for example, with mumps, have elevated white blood cells, elevated protein, but normal glucose levels. Question 291. A boy with worsening ear pain and headaches recently had otitis media. The left mastoid is tender and swollen. What's the next step? MRI. We need to look for an abscess in the temporal lobe. We need to treat with antibiotics and surgery may be required to remove the infected bone and drain the mastoid. Question 292. A patient with subacute symptoms of meningitis has CSF findings of the following. What is the pathogen? So here or here, these parameters are consistent with tuberculosis. The difference between bacterial meningitis and tuberculosis meningitis is that in tuberculosis meningitis, the white blood cells are not very elevated. The glucose, of course, is still low. Question 293. An infant with hepatosmolar megaly jaundice, periventricular calcifications most likely has CMV associated with sensorineural hearing loss, which is the most common symptom in CMV in kids. Question 294. A 10-year-old boy has severe ear pain, unilateral facial paralysis, and a fascicular rash in the external auditory canal. What is the pathogen? So over here, we're dealing with varicella. This is the triad of herpes zoster oticus, where we see the ear pain, the unilateral facial paralysis, and the vesicular rash. This is called Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Var 295 pronated drift is a sign of upper motor neuron lesion. Impaired proprioception can be tested by holding the most distal joint of a digit by its sides and moving it slightly up or down. Ask the patient if they feel is going up or down. Question 296. A 41 year old man presents with pharyngeal muscle weakness, slurred speech, tongue fasciculations, and a jaw jerk reflex. What's the next step? So these sounds like symptoms associated with LALS, electromyography is what we wanted to do next. Question 297, levator reticularis, mononeuritis, multi-complex, and elevated ESR are conditions or symptoms associated with polyritis nodosa. Other findings you can see over here, fever, weight loss, renal insufficiency, but the point is there's no lung involvement in polyritis nodosa, but it affects basically every other part of the body. Question 298, a 34-year-old woman with no significant medical history presents with unilateral upper and lower facial drooping over several hours. Vital signs are within normal limits. Hearing is intact. What's the next steps over here? We do nothing because this is facial palsy and we treat with high dose steroids and plus or minus a cycle of year, depending on who you ask. So question 299, a 26-year-old woman presents with bilateral upper extremity weakness and diffuse abdominal pain of several days duration. Urobilinogen is positive. What will reveal the diagnosis? So over here, we're dealing with a heme synthesis defect, intermittent porphyria, autosomal dominant condition. It leads to abdominal pain, which is actually neuropathic. It leads to peripheral neuropathy and neuropsychiatric manifestations, such as the restlessness and hallucinations. Lab values include a buildup of porphyrinogen and Allah. Question 300, a 43-year-old man presents with muscles that contract involuntarily, causing the head to twist or turn to one side. Complete neuro exam is normal. What is the treatment for this? So over here, we're dealing with the spasm, which we have botulinum toxin. We're dealing with cervical dystonia, spasmodic torticollis, and we treat this with botulinum toxin in order to relax the muscles. Question 301, an HIV patient has developed numbness and pregnant bricks in his bilateral low extremities. Motor strength is intact, but the ankle jerk reflex is decreased bilaterally. What's the best treatment? So for this, we give gabapentin. This is distal symmetric polyneuropathy, which shows up in HIV patients, and it has this glove, uh, this glove, <clears throat> And it has this distribution over here, this distal symmetric polyneuropathy, and we treat it with gabapentin. Question 302, a 34-year-old man has sudden onset of dysphagia, SR3, and blurred vision, followed by a decreased bilateral extremity muscle strength. What is the next steps so over here? We want to give antitoxin, because here we're dealing with foodborne botulism. That's what's going on over here. That's why he has this descending paralysis starting to develop. And patients can also present with diaphragmatic weakness with respiratory failure. We treat with antitoxin, but even before we confirm the diagnosis. 303, a 30-year-old woman presents with severe Several month history of fatigue, ptosis, decreased grip strength, and inability to let go of her grip. She has asked to close her eyes and has difficult time opening them. What's the condition associated with hypogonadism, cataracts, again, myotonic dystrophy? 304, a 67 year old woman has symmetric proximal limbicus, reduced deep tendon reflexes, and chronic cough. Chest CT shows a lung mass. What is the mechanism over here? We're dealing with autoantibodies against vulture calcium channels. This is Lambert myasthenic syndrome with a small cell lung cancer association. 305, what tremor decreases with voluntary movement? Parkinson syndrome decreases with voluntary movement. 
Essential gets worse with volunteer movement. Cerebellar gets worse as you approach the target. And physiologic is barely noticeable, associated with caffeine anxiety. 306, a businesswoman has weakness of the left and big toe dorsiflexion and apparent sensation of the lateral shin and dorsal foot. What's the mechanism? So we're here, we're dealing with a common fibular defect. She crosses her legs too much. It can cause common fibular or peroneal nerve neuropathy. It results from damage or compression, such as prolonged crossing legs. 307, a 20-year-old woman with Crohn's disease has a month history of worsening fatigue and painful feet paresthesia reflexes are intact and the vibration and proprioception are intact so everything's intact her hemoglobin is low what's the next steps so over here we want to get serum vitamin b12 levels that's perhaps causing the paresthesias this is associated with Crohn's disease because of the problem with absorption of intrinsic factor. Question 308, a 49-year-old woman presents with a history of hypertension controlled with ACEs and hydrochlorothiazide and have a severe weakness. The EKG is shown with flat T waves and U waves. This is an electrolyte abnormality. This is hypokalemia, which can be caused by thiazide, such as hydrochlorothiazide, causing hypokalemia because of the potassium wasting. It can cause weakness, just like hyperkalemia, but it presents with fatigue, muscle cramps, and it could lead to paralysis. And the EKG shows flat and broad T waves and U waves. We treat it, of course, with potassium. Question 309, Imran presents with numbness in the, me in the medial hand. Over the last several months, he also has decreased sensation over the fourth and fifth digits, along with decreased grip, strength, and wrist flexion. Where is the nerve injury? And this is at the elbow. Injury at the elbow has the additional hypothenar eminence, numbness, and decreased grip strength. 310, a 41-year-old man presents with several weeks of low-grade fevers, fatigue, and dry eyes, and now this morning woke up with fo facial nerve palsy. Calcium is elevated. What's the cause of the palsy? So this is likely sarcoidosis. That's why there's an elevated calcium. Facial nerve palsy is a manifestation of sarcoidosis, along with other conditions such as uveitis, diabetes, insipidus, AV block, and cardiomyopathy, as well as hepatomegaly. Question 311, a man has deficits with knee extension after an accident, as well as reduced sensation in the anterior thigh, and medial lower leg, what nerve was damaged? This was a femoral nerve. Femoral nerve can get injured from hip dislocation, pelvic fracture, or a hematoma in the thigh. Boots from L2 to L4. Question 312, skin depigmentation, attacks with positive Romberg sign, anemia and brittle hair are seen with which deficiency? This is copper deficiency. Copper deficiency is most often due to malabsorption from prior gastric surgery. We treat with copper and then we stop taking zinc because too much zinc can cause copper deficiency. Question 313, a 34-year-old male IV drug user is found with weakness, lethargy, ptosis, dilated pupils, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, and several cutaneous abscesses. Respiratory rate is 19. What's the next step? So we want to give botulinum antitoxin. He's likely having a botulinum infection. It was mere opioid intoxication. Now it would cause weakness, lethargy, and respiratory failure, but bradypnea and ptosis would be uncommon. 314, an eight-year-old boy has excessive daytime sleepiness despite good sleep hygiene. He has difficulty opening his hands after squeezing the physician's fingers. Autosobal dominant is myotonic dystrophy. Question 315, a 12-year-old girl has a history of rapid onset bilateral abnormal upper extremity and then lower extremity movements during the day. Sensation is normal, neuro exam is otherwise normal, and mental status is intact. What's the next step? So here, she's having Chorea. We want to get an anti streptolysin O titer. Kids, it's usually due to GIS, group A strep, Sydenham chorea. We also test with AKG and echo for rheumatic fever. 316. Which symptom associated with facial nerve palsy is considered red, red flag requiring workup? All of the above are considered red flags for facial nerve palsy. For example, sparing of the upper face could be a sign of a stroke. Flu like illness could be a sign of Lyme serology. 317. 13 year old girl presents with a worsening headache over the last 24 hours with nausea and vomiting. The headache is in the right frontal area and is pulsatile. Similar headaches have occurred monthly. Neuro exam, vital signs are normal. What's the next best step? So over here we want to get no testing. This is likely a migraine, which is a clinical diagnosis. 318, progressive headache, neck pain, stiffness, obesity, along with elevated ICP despite normal CSF content is associated with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The lumbar puncture shows elevated opening pressure, for example, above 250. 319, a 45-year-old woman presents with a monthly history of constant pressure headaches in the temporal and occipital regions. Headaches last an hour and often occur at work. She has no nausea or visual symptoms. So the fact that these occur at work leans in the direction of a tension headache. She's likely stressed. That's what's going on over here. Often tenderness, muscle tenderness in the head, neck, and shoulders. 320, a 40-year-old woman presents with achy jaw pain, facial pain, and headaches. What is the most likely diagnosis? This is likely TMJ, sign arthritis. That would be in a patient above 50. 321, which of the following has not been shown be helpful in preventing migraines. Sertraline, an antidepressant, has not been helpful in preventing migraines, but propranolol, amitriptyline, and topiramate may all be helpful. 
And remember, the triptans and sands and ergotamine, they're all abortive. 322, which of the following are contraindicated in migraine with aura? So all of the following are contraindicated in a patient with migraine with aura because they could lead to ischemic stroke. 323, headaches and seizures in a postpartum woman with normal blood pressure and a family history of UVT. What's the next step? So we want to get an MRI of the head with MR venography because here we're dealing with a possible cerebral vein thrombosis, which is basically like a DVT of the head. We want to get an MR venography and we treat them with anticoagulation, heparin or warfarin. We're not sure which one is better. 324, it's a 12-year-old girl with DM has two weak history of blurry vision, sometimes has nausea and headaches. Visual fields have enlarged bi- spots bilaterally. Retinal exam is showing what's the diagnosis over here. It's idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Here is the papilledema. It's most common in young obese women, but could be found even in non-obese children. We get neuroimaging, and if not, the lumbar puncture is diagnostic as the pressure goes down and treatment is with acetazolamide. 325, a 10-year-old girl is brought to the ED for visual disturbances. She saw flashing lights and then, and then vision loss. The physical exam is normal. What's the next step? So here we want to get NSAIDs because here we're dealing with a migraine. And in kids, it's often bifrontal. 326, a 70-year-old male is brought in by his daughter due to poor adherence to his diabetic regimen. She also describes that he's been falling recently and he's been wetting his pants. Here we're dealing with wet, wobbly, and wacky. We want to get an MRI of the brain for normal pressure hydrocephalus. 327, a 60-year-old woman has two-year history of memory loss, periodic confusion, fluctuation in cognition, visual, visual hallucinations, and Parkinsonism. MRI shows generalized cortical atrophy. What's the diagnosis? This is Lua body dementia. Where we see confusion, hallucinations, and Parkinsonian motor symptoms present at the same time, as opposed to in Parkinson, where the dementia occurs much later on. 328, a 66-year-old man with no significant medical history or medications has a one-year history of left hand tremor and stiffness. He also has poor balance and slowness. What is required? Required for diagnosis. So over here, we're dealing with Parkinson's. We don't need anything for diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis. The CT is often remar- unremarkable, and MRI may be helpful to exclude other conditions, but Parkinson's is a clinical diagnosis where we see two of the following either tremor, rigidity, or bradykinesia. 329, a 66 year old man has had slowly progressive right hand weakness for three months, ALS. Where is the abnormality in ALS? It's the anterior horn cell. That's ALS. ALS leads to degenerations of cell in the anterior horn of the spinal cord, asymmetric weakness, and upper motor, lower motor neuron signs. 330, a 66 year old woman with one year history of compulsions, executive dysfunction, apathy, tried to hug and kiss men on the street. What should be given? So here we're dealing with PIC disease, frontotemporal dysplasia. We want to give citalopram for the, that aspect for the sexual disinhibition. 331, a tremor that decreases with voluntary movement, reaching for a mode is seen in an essential tremor that gets worse with voluntary movement, rather basal ganglia dysfunction, Parkinson's disease. It gets, uh, when your voluntary movement makes it better. 332, cortical and subcortical infarctions are associated with vascular dementia and lacunar strokes. 333, in which lobe does Alzheimer's disease begin? This is the temporal lobe. Don't forget about that. It shows uh, neuroimaging may show temporal lobe atrophy. And medications, you can take a look at the bottom over here, what they include. 334, a 55 year old man has rapidly progressive dementia and startle induced involuntary muscle spasm. EEG shows periodic sharp wave complexes. What is the outcome? This is death within a year. This is Cruziaco. 335, quite a nucleus and put a matter results in degeneration of neurons which produce the GABA cells. This is hunting the disease that we see, degeneration of GABA producing neurons. 336, a heavy chronic alcoholic has wide base gait and he's a walker to ambient cognition and intact, whereas the defect is the punji fibers of the cerebellum. That's what leads to these problems in alcoholic and chronic alcoholics. 337, four definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's made. What do you need to check? You need to get vitamin B12 levels because maybe there is this uh, problem, neuropsychological problems because of the vitamin B12 levels. That's why you need to get this along with CBC, TSH, etc. 338, acute angle closure glaucoma can be precipitated by an anticholinergic such as this one because of the pupil dilation. It could also be instigated by walking to a dark room. 339, a 64-year-old man who used to sing now has a soft voice. Basically, what's the diagnosis over here? I'm just going to get to it. It's Parkinson's syndrome. It often presents as a tremor, but could also present with bulbar symptoms, such as in this patient over here. And what gave it away that it's not ALS, well, one of the things is that there's decreased smell. ALS does not affect the senses. It does not affect vision. It does not affect smell. And it does not affect sensation. 340, a 65-year-old man presents with progressively worsening concentration and judgment for the last two months. Nystagmus is present along with mild spasticity, myoclonus, and hyperflexia, preem disease over here. And that's why he has this myoclonus and nystagmus and other symptoms. 341, initial diagnosis of work of a first-time seizure in an adult includes. So we want to get these electrolytes, glucose, urine, toxicology for a first-time seizure. 342, a patient has generalized convulsive static epilepticus and is given benzodiazepines. He remains unresponsive. So what's the next step? So we want to get an EEG to know if the unresponsiveness is due to the sedation.
oxidation of the benzos or the persistent seizure that he's having. 343, a nine-year-old boy stares into space and then tilts his head to the right and develops right arm twitching. The episode's last three minutes. The patient seems tired and confused afterwards. It's most likely a diagnosis. It's not an absent seizure because we won't see this post-tickle stage. It's actually a focal seizure. Focal seizures originate in a single hemisphere and can spread to both hemispheres. 344, a 20-year-old man, non-compliant with met seizure medication, developed satire up like this for 10 minutes. What's he at risk for? Cortical necrosis is a problem with having a seizure for too long. 345, a woman on phenytoin is seizure-free for several years and now wants to, she wants to get pregnant. What should she do? She could taper off phenytoin slowly. She shouldn't do it too quickly. But since she's off, she's had um, several years since the seizure, it's about time. Two years is the amount of time that we want seizure-free before reducing the antithelopathy medications, which should be tapered slowly. 346, a 19-year-old girl about to take an exam, falls to the floor with force, and her body shakes rapidly. The episode lasts a minute until she tells someone to take her to the ED. He describes the event to the physician. What's the diagnosis? So here is psychogenic non-elliptic seizure because she's describing the event. It's likely she ep- she witnessed a seizure in the past and in the recent past and she's uh, reliving it and it's kind of like a uh, conversion disorder type thing with seizures. 347, a five-year-old boy undergoes a seizure and now cannot move his right arm or leg. CT and MRI are normal. What's most likely outcome? So this is self-resolution within 36 hours. That's Todd's paralysis associated with seizures. 348, generalized convulsive static oblique. This is treated with IV benzodiazepines, followed by levetiracetam. This is levetiracetam, phosphantoin, or valproic acid are all used if benzos don't work. 349, a three-year-old boy is roughly due to seizures. He's now alert and playful, but temperature is high. He has no cough, vomiting, or diarrhea, and the rest of the pee is normal. After acetaminophen, what's the next best step? So you want to discharge home because this is just a febrile seizure. 350, a woman with diabetes mellitus has back and leg pain associated with weakness, paresthesia in the, in the foot, and now upgoing plantar effects and right-sided hyperactive knee jerk. These symptoms have developed over the last two months. What's the next step? So in this case, we want to get MRI of the spine because it's not just merely a diabetic neuropathy. First of all, diabetic neuropathy doesn't develop so rapidly. Secondly, diabetic neuropathy usually causes symmetric stocking and pattern of sensory loss and proprioception. And that's why it's likely we're dealing with a malignancy or something else affecting the spine. We want to get an MRI. 351, low back pain radiating to the butt, lateral thigh, lateral shin, and dorsal foot, along with weakness and foot dorsiflexion, is due to an L5 lesion. That's why it affects, it. for example, over here, the dorsal foot. You got to get this down, L4, L5, S1, from medial to lateral. And an S1 lesion wouldn't cause low back pain or butt pain. We'd have to be a little higher at L5. 352, a seven year old man with a history of lung cancer presents with two weeks of breakfast, leg weakness, and increased urinary headaches. He has back pain in several months. Cardiac equinus syndrome is more associated with the urinary symptoms. 353, a woman with RA develops weakness, paresthesias, and hyperreflexia after intubation. This is due to instability of the anthraxial joint that's seen in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, especially during intubation. We want to get an MRI. And treatments with surgery. 354, a 66 year old man presents with progressive neck pain, gait disturbances, lo- lower motor neuron signs in the arms, with upper motor neurons in the legs and feet. What's the diagnosis? So, this is a cervical spondylotic myo- myelopathy, which is associated with spinal canal narrowing. Question 355, a 35 year old woman was playing volleyball when she experienced neck and upper back pain. She now has constant dull and intermittent sharp pain with neck movement that radiates to the right hand. Sorry, I gave it away. So, you want to avoid triggering activities and NSAIDs because this is just, just a cervical radiculopathy. It's a clinical diagnosis and most patients improve with avoidance of triggering activities and NSAIDs. 356 to 37 year old woman has bilateral lower extremity weakness associated with upper motor neuron signs, urinary incontinence, and sensation deafness below the level of umbilicus. What's the cause? So this is not compression of the quadra equina because it wouldn't go up to the umbilicus. This is segmental inflammation of the spinal cord. That's transverse myelitis. Treatment is with steroids and often plasma phoresis. It's associated with multiple sclerosis and sarcoidosis. 357 and 6 year old man was in a car accident. He has numbness, tingling, marked weakness in both upper extremities. He can move his legs with the diagnosis. This is a central cord syndrome, as we mentioned at the beginning of the video, which is associated with hyperextension injuries. 358, a 50-year-old man in a car accident states that he has neck pain, blood pressure is low, there are abrasions, the bruises, heart sounds are normal, pulse is 50, cannot move any extremities. What's the cause of the low blood pressure? This is injury to the descending tracts. What happens is there's an acute spinal injury, which leads to a neurogenic shock due to interruption of the descending sympathetic fibers. It leads to unopposed parasympathetic stimulation of the gagus, and that's why it leads to these symptoms. 359, a 60-year-old woman has intermittent right side and neck and shoulder pain, worse with neck movement and associated with forearm numbness. Both extremities are normal bilaterally. What we will most likely see on an x-ray, so cervical spondylosis, and you could take a look at the explanations over here. 360, a 19-year-old man is in a motorcycle accident. CT scan of the cervical spine shows a mild displaced fracture of the right C5 lamina. The patient has mild weakness of the right wrist extension and loss of pinprick sensation of the right thumb. What's the next steps over here? We want to get a CT scan of the thoracic and lumbar spine because if you see a single vertebral fracture, you need to image the entire spine with CAT scan, not an X-ray. 
because we need to image the spinal cord. 361, a 25 year old woman has weakness and numbness in both arms and legs that has progressively worsened over the last few days. She has no fever, there's no trauma, and she has no medical condition. MRI shows T2 signaling in the cervical spine cord, shows T2 signaling in the cervical spinal cord. What should be done? Steroids, because again, we're dealing with a transverse myelitis, IV plasma paresis if there's no response. 362, the best test to screen for cervical spinal injury if spinal tenderness neurological deficit is CT without contrast, cervical spinal cord injury. MRI is only done when the CT scan suggests, suggests ligamentous or spinal cord injury to better visualize the soft tissue. 363, a 67-year-old woman is brought to the ED due to a bilateral leg when is tingling for five hours. Spinal tenderness is present at T6. Upper extremity strength is intact. MRI reveals fluid collection spanning T6 to T8. What's the next best step? Emergent laminectomy and decompression. Here we're dealing with a potentially spinal epidural abscess. She probably has fever also, which is, and this is a neurological emergency requiring laminectomy. Question 364, a 30-year-old woman had loss of pain and temperature along with diminished strength on the upper limbs, vibration proprioception preserved, and her legs have no abnormalities. What's the cause? So here we're dealing with a fluid-filled cavity in the central spinal cord because this is syringomyelia. It has this uh, distribution. 365, what's the first step in a patient with cervical spine trauma with a potentially diaphragmatic paralysis and intermittent respiratory failure? We want to go with intubation. The CRICO is only done if the intubation fails. 366, a harmful substance such as the retained urinary catheter or constipation below the level of lesion in a patient with spinal cord injury may lead to severe hypertension, fecal impaction, and other symptoms due to what's going on over here. Well, there's both an intact parasympathetic response and an unregulated sympathetic response. That's the pathophysiology going on over here where there's this trigger and it leads to this downward spiral and we have to stop it. It's called autonomic dysreflexia seen in spinal cord injury patients. 367, the cross straight leg test has a high specificity for disc herniation. Crust straight leg test with exacerbation of pain with positive lifting of the unaffected leg has sensitivity, has poor sensitivity, but high specificity for disc herniation. Don't confuse this with the Kernig side for meningitis. 368, a 79 year old woman has weakness in upper and lower extremities, intrinsic hand muscle atrophy, stiffness, hyper in her legs, and low sign positive. What's the diagnosis? So we're here, we're dealing with a compressed spinal cord. Here we're dealing with a 79 year old woman, so it's unlikely multiple sclerosis. And with multiple sclerosis, we don't see lower motor on, neuron signs such as atrophy. And just in green I wrote over here, the lower motor neuron signs include fasciculations, atrophy, and reduced tone. Far, fasciculations, atrophy, and reduced tone. Here we're dealing with a cervical myelopathy. 369, a 65 year old man with pain in the low back and legs has improvement of symptoms with walking down her flexion of the back. What will reveal the most likely diagnosis? So here we're dealing with lumbar stenosis, which improves with flexion. MRI will reveal, reveal the diagnosis. 370 man who underwent thoracic aortic aneurysm repair now has lower extremity bilateral flaccid process, loss of tender temperature, crude touch, and urinary tension proprioception is intact. What what happened? Ischemia occurred. Thoracic aortic aneurysm repair can cause ischemia leading to anterior cord syndrome, and that's why he has this bilateral flaccid paralysis. Proprioception is intact because it does not affect the dorsal column. 371 of 34 year old woman with a history of neck pain after she fell a month ago has left shoulder pain. P shows decreased pain in the left thumb and the index fingers is also weakest with left elbow flexion and decreased bicep reflex. What is the cause? This is a spinal nerve root compression. 372, a patient with acute spinal cord injury is stabilized. Neurosurgery is on their way. What's the next steps? So over here, we want to get a bladder cath. Bladder cath in spinal cord injury patients is really important to prevent further damage. 373, a contralateral leg weakness without pupillary involvement is seen with, is seen with sub thalassine herniation. Sub thalassine herniation, there's no pupillary involvement. 374, prolonged concussion symptoms with otherwise intact neuro exam should be managed with. Symptomatic care and activity as activity is tolerated. Patients with post-concussion syndrome generally improve within three months. 375, a man in a motorcycle accident does not answer questions or open his eyes but withdraws the pain. Brain imaging shows cerebral edema but no hematomas or fractures. How should reduction be performed? With hypertonic saline, it helps along with mannitol, some prefer hypertonic saline as part of reducing the elevated intracranial pressure. Lumbar puncture isn't done because it can lead to brain herniation. 376, patients with concussions, transient and disorientation, headache, dizziness can return to full activity generally in a week. Now in 24 hours, rest is indicated for at least 24 hours, gradually increasing activity level, and they could fully return in about one week. 377, a five-year-old boy hit his head on the floor with mild pain, got up and walked normally for several minutes, and developed headache, vomiting, and then somnolence. So this is the lucency period, which is really seen in both, but on exam day, lucency periods are generally associated with the epidural hematoma, the lucid period minutes to hours. Subdural hematoma, especially the chronic one, is associated with elderly and alcoholics. 378, which is most associated with unconscious and decorded position, is a 
central herniation. 379, what can be observed in a brain dead patient? Deep 10, deep 10 reflexes, because that's the spinal cord. 380, after a hard hike and fall, a 26 year old female has neck pain and unilateral headache. P shows ptosis and meiosis of the left eye. Neuroexemptors, normal motor strength, deep 10 reflexes, sensation in all extremities. What occurred is a carotid artery dissection leading to this stroke symptoms. That's a cause of stroke in younger patients. And in this example, we may give TPA if it's in 4.5 hours because it may have led to this thrombus. 381, which head injury would be an indication for CT scan without contrast? which would be an indication for CTG without contrast versus sending home all of the above. All of these are concerning features. You can take a look at why. 382, rapidly progressive bilateral low extremity weakness with upper motor neuron signs, such as hyperflexia, sensitive defects, and bladder dysfunction are seen in immune destruction of the spinal cord, transverse myelitis. That's where we see these signs. Not acute inflammatory demyelination. That's an example, uh, for example, in uh, guillain barre syndrome, there are no upper motor neuron signs. 383, a 58-year-old man is brought to the ED after he was found unresponsive. He was severe. He has severe neurologic impairment, but no major CD findings or obvious signs of trauma. What happened? Why was he unresponsive? So the answer is he likely had a punctuate hemorrhage in the white matter. Diffuse axonal injury causes this impairment without major CT findings. 384, a boy with poor lineal growth, puberty delayed, worsening headaches, papilledema most likely has a craniopharyngioma, at least these symptoms where this compression of the pituitary suck leads to growth uh, failure due to low TSH or DH, low LH and FSH lead to puberty delay, and there's an optic chiasm compression leading to problems with the eyes. 385, a woman with a history of radiation now has bilateral arm and leg weakness and upper motor neuron signs, vital signs are normal, MRI shows a homogeneous enhancing mass at SC2. What is the diagnosis of spinal meningioma? Um, it's associated with exposing ionization or radiation. 386, a 64 year old man has a mild tremor with increase during, which increases during finger to nose testing. What's the treatment? So, this primidone for essential tremor that explains why it increases during the testing because it increases with when you're trying to reach a target. 387, what's the treatment for the tumor, tumor as shown? So, this is meningioma, surgical removal. We want to surgically remove the meningioma even though they're benign because they could have mass effects. 388, a 63 year old man has been uh, has been at, acutely agitated for 20 minutes after arriving at the post anesthesia care unit. He's anxious, confused, and restless. What's the next step? We want to give reassurance because he's just simply inadequate emergence from general anesthesia. You need to wait a little bit longer than 20 minutes. 389, during induction of labor, a woman with no significant pregnancy complications develops generalized tonic-clonic seizures. What causes her to have the seizures? So, bupivacaine, and it can lead to CNS overactivity and even seizures. 390, a paper presents with a rapidly increasing head size, but she's asymptomatic, so what's the next step? So we want to give an MRI because we're concerned because hydrocephalus. 391, a 35-year-old with to ED, do a first-time seizure. Uh, you can take a look at the question, what's the diagnosis? This is mass in the frontal lobe, it leads to these problems. It could lead to the papilledema. It could lead. It has a mass effect. 392, a 60 year old woman with RA presents with headaches and has bilateral symmetric weakness of the lower limbs, upper motor neuron signs, and urinary incontinence. What's the cause over here? Here we're dealing with a parasagittal meningioma, a benign low grade tumor. It can affect just the legs and it has upper motor neuron and low motor neuron signs. You could take a look at the other choices, why they're not true. 393, a five year old girl with a ventriculo peritoneal shunt develops vomiting, irritability, and lethargy, but no fever. So it sounds like it's a problem with the shunt. What's the next step? We want to get a TCC CT scan ahead to see if the shunt is in proper place. 394, a 38-year-old woman presents with the worst headache of her life. She also has hypotension, bilateral visual field defects, and ophthalmopegia. What's the diagnosis? It's not subarachnoid hemorrhage. That will be associated with hypertension. Here it's likely a pituitary hypoplexy, which is hemorrhage and acute ischemia of the pituitary. 395, 23-year-old male with HIV and low CD4 has this irregular ring, ring hand lesion in the paraventricular area. CSF is positive for ABV. What's the diagnosis here? It's a primary CNS lymphoma in toxic diagnosis. We see multiple ring enhancing lesions. 396, a four month old boy has head circumference at 96 percentile, but no symptoms. And this has been consistent. What's the next step? Reassurance and observation. It's normal for a person to have a big head. Macrocephaly is when the head circumference is bigger than 97th percentile. 397, a 55-year-old man has repeated episodes of the violent episode of the night. His dreams lack muscle atonia. What will he most likely develop? An alpha cytonuclein neurogenic disorder because he has this, what's called a REM sleep behavior disorder, which is almost like a prodrome for Parkinson's and Lewy body disease. 398, a woman has recurrent forceful contractions of the eyelids triggered by bright lights. So this is blepharospasm, which you could take a look at over here. And when there's jaw pain, it's also called MIG syndrome. And the treatment is trigger avoidance, botulinum toxin, and severe symptoms. 399, a woman has extensive daytime sleepiness, hallucinations, and falling asleep and sleep paralysis. What's the first line of treatment for narcolepsy? It's modafinil, which is a stimulant sometimes used also in sleep apnea. 400, the most common central nervous tumor in children is astrocytoma. It's the most common central nervous tumor in children it usually occurs in the frontal, parietal, or temporal lobe. And here are updates to neurology. As I promised, I would mention, for example, TPA is 4.5 hours, not 3. Restless egg syndrome, we go with Gabalin or pregabalin used to be dopinagonist. Daravon was approved of for ALS.
TLS we give with Riliuzol. Indie Inc. for Cryptococcus was discontinued. Now we go with cryptococcal antigen testing. Shingrix is given at age 50, used to be age 60. VMAT inhibitors such as tetrabenazine are preferred for Tourette's, it used to be antipsychotics. And guanfazine we would give if the patient has ADHD. For CJD, CSF, real-time quacking-induced conversion, is diagnostic test of choice. It used to be the 1433 protein detection. But no, the real-time quacking-induced conversion is more sensitive and specific. I hope you enjoyed. Take care.